Yes, Yes, you are good. Yes, you are good. Hallelujah. Oh, bless your wonderful day. Give the Lord a hand, clap of praise, like you know he's good. Not that you heard he was good, but you know that he's good. Because in your darkest hour, he came to your rescue, and he brought you through. Give the Lord another hand. But I just want to come to church with noise. You know, I sit in that office, and all I hear is the construction workers beeping, fussing, and cussing. I come to church to hear some noise because the Lord is good. I almost got into the accident today, but the Lord is good. So I just want to know if anybody else knows that the Lord is good. Live in church. We ain't live in the church. Let's go on back home. Any praise reports? I'm glad to see you. Smile is still pretty. Any prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. Isaiah. And your brother. Melvin Raystrom. Oh, wow. Sister Deidre. Anybody else? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come this evening full of thanksgiving. For in spite of our everyday encounters, you still are good. God, you've watched over us, you've protected us. And God, we just believe that you will see us through whatever heartache, pain, and suffering we must go through. God, names have been called of those who need you. Some don't really know they need you, but they really do. So God, we ask that you allow those of us who are under the sound of my voice to be ministers to them, not to tell them they need to come to church, but they just need to trust in you. God grant, as you see fit, that you know they have need of. God, now as we prepare to study your holy word, open our hearts and our minds and our ears, that we might be receptive. And let that that we hear maturate in our spirit, that we may become more useful tools in the building of your kingdom. Continue to bless our pastor, keep him studious in the word, that he might bring us what we need to get through on this journey. These and also many other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hand clap of praise. Come on, let's bless him. Let's bless him. Let's bless him. Thank you, Deacon Gates. Thank you, Lady A. Thank you, Isaiah, for setting the atmosphere for our worship on tonight. We greet you tonight, as always, with Jesus' joy. We are grateful and thankful for this, another opportunity God has given us to assemble in his house and to delight, to delight ourselves in the study of his holy and his righteous word. We are grateful for each and every one of you who are in the building. Thank God for our young people who are on the way to have their study. And we're grateful for those who are joining us virtually on tonight. And tonight, we will again and prayerfully put the finishing touches on this series that's entitled Living from Above and Within. Throughout this series, we've engaged in what it means to walk in the light of eternity. And we are now in the section of the series that talks about what it means to be victorious Christians or living victoriously as Christians in this world. The subject matter explores the idea of those things that hinder us or serve to prohibit us from walking victoriously in Jesus Christ. I'm going to get right to it because my objective is to stay close tonight to our handout. Perfectly, those of you 
in the building have your hand out. And those of you who joined us virtually, you have your hand out. I'm going to try to finish this series on tonight. Um, but as we set the atmosphere for conclusion, I just want to remind you <clears throat> that we learned a few things concerning what hinders us from walking victoriously uh, and living victoriously as Christians. One is that <clears throat> we have to learn how to conquer what we call human calculations, that is, our own reasoning and how it is <clears throat> that we are oftentimes excuse what is possible with God by our own thinking. Uh, we also looked at that we needed to learn how to manage the clock, if you will, and that is to diminish the considerations of time restrictions. Uh, we also looked at what it means to give the problem to the Lord. Let the Lord's bat, let the Lord fight the battle. Let Him handle the situations because uh, all of our dilemmas, uh, we ought to learn to delegate to the Lord, and He can handle them. And then we looked at the fact that we ought to expect more from the outcome because we have God in our lives, right? Uh, we might be able to calculate an outcome, but we ought to have an expectation that is more God-focused than anything else. We looked at the fact that what, what would hinder a person from living victoriously uh, is that they can have a mindset or branded mind, they, some things that are already in the context of their thinking, some things that have set up in their consciousness, perhaps from previous experiences or previous circumstances. But as a result of that, you've made up in your mind, I ain't going through that no more. I ain't going to do that no more. I ain't going to let that happen to me anymore. The truth of the matter is, when you set those things in your head and in your heart, you could sometimes cause yourself to miss out on what God has in store. Um, because God, again, has called us to be a conqueror and an overcomer. And sometimes your blessings is on the other side of your problem. Right, And if you have a stronghold or a mindset or a mentality that says, I shall not, I shall not be moved, you may not be moved, but neither will you, will you be blessed. <laughs> Am I making sense? And so we need to learn literally how to, how to understand that there are things that are set up in our hearts uh, or therefore in our minds that serve as stumbling blocks or strongholds that prevent us from living the victorious life. Uh, we we look thoroughly at what the pathology of spiritual transformation is, and we what we mean by spiritual transformation is that of living the victorious Christian life. We know that we are always abounding, right? All, always growing and always maturing, so we're always willing to change. And we identify that the way we change is how. Anybody remember? Nope. <laughs> Sister Gates is thoroughly checking her notes got our own our hearts and minds change how yeah we'll be transformed but what does that mean how do you, how do we make a change how do we go from one state to another rejuvenation no ma'am no let me give it to you again because y'all are all wrong and y'all making me look like a bad teacher and Right. Truth of the matter is the way the way you change any situation and any circumstances, you take in new information. When you take in new information, then that new information gives you what you need to make adjustments. And so spiritual transformation is us living a life where we take in new information. We take in God information that we might become what more godly. Y'all remember now? <clears throat> and so. The, the, what, what can stand in the way of that process is that you have defined yourself and then you let yourself drive or define your life. That's just the way I am. That's just what I do. That's, that's who we are, right? And then here comes God and offers you new information. And the byproduct of that is you resist or reject that new information because what? That's just who I am. That's just what I do. That's just who we are. Are you with, with me? And that means you're in the way of God. <clears throat> Y'all are mighty quiet, right? God is trying to do something for you, do something to you, do something right through you. But because oftentimes we already have a, a self-definition, we can't, we can't experience the newness of God. And so that, again, causes us not to be able to live that, that, that uh, victorious Christian life. We looked at how it is that spiritual transformation leads to spiritual awareness. Are y'all with me? The process by which one becomes 
uh, adept at spirituality is by going through the process of spiritual transformation. The more you learn of God, the more of God, you, God like you become. I'm just trying to hit some highlights to get to where we need to be. Um, you know your new nature in God by call, because of spiritual transformation. Are y'all tracking? Right? You didn't know who you were before you came to the Lord, but you met the Lord and the Lord started telling you about who you were in him. And that was a new you. That's why you sing songs like thing I used to do. I don't do no more places I used to go. I don't go no more. It's because you've been changed. And you changed because you did what? Took in new information. And that new information caused you to have spiritual awareness or spiritual realization that you did not have in times past. That whole process is called spiritual regeneration. I think I heard somebody say that earlier, that when you go, when you, when you set yourself in the process of spiritual realization, it leads to regeneration. Now, the root word of regeneration is the word gene. I'm going to say it again. The root word of the word regeneration is the word gene. We know the word gene because it's popular to us through the means of genealogy. Genealogy is where we get our identity, or at least it's where we claim it. Y'all stay with me. It's where we claim our identity. And as a result of claiming our identity through genealogy, we oftentimes identify ourselves in context with that genealogy. But if you've been regenerated, are y'all with me? Through spirituality, then now you're beginning to accept a new nature, a new identity in Christ. And, and once you accept the new identity in Christ, it should be, watch this, that that message is sent to your mind and your mind begins to think in accordance with the newness of life. But oftentimes it isn't because our minds are bombarded with things that we have set up as identifying factors of who we are. And so God says to us, you're saved, right? You say, but I'm a sinner. God says that you're blessed. You say, but no, no, I'm struggling. Are, are you understanding? And it's all because of the process. We don't understand that the spiritual transformation track. I, I explained it this way this morning. I think I'll try it again tonight. Um, we were in the airport uh, a, few, a couple of weeks ago. I don't know when it was. We were in the airport and there's this thing in the airport. I don't even know what it's called. Um, it's not an elevator. It's not an escalator. It kind of looks like it, but you know, people are walking. And if you step up on it, it's moving slowly. I, yeah, moving sidewalk. A moving sidewalk is what it's called. Yeah, a moving sidewalk. Well, uh, well, you can walk on it, right? And you move faster than you could if you were walking at a different dimension because you stepped up on it, it has with built into it the trajectory of taking you forward. And even while you're going forward, if you stand still, you're still gonna go faster than you did when you were walking. Are you with me on the ground? Well, if you start to walk on it, then you'll walk even faster. Are y'all understanding? That's how transformation, the spiritual transformation occurs in the life of the believer. You step out of the world onto this walk, moving sidewalk. Thank you for educating me. But then watch this. You stand on the moving sidewalk and you go further than you were going when you were walking. But then while you're on it, you realize I haven't lost the ability to walk. I can walk even though this is moving. So now I start to work with the, with the elevator and I move fast. I move faster, right? And I go further. Are y'all understand what I'm teaching? That's spiritual regeneration, right? So now you become aware of things that from a spiritual I'm going home with her. Um, all right. Thank you both. Uh, and so spiritual, so we got spiritual regeneration uh, and spiritual regeneration is the spiritual transformation within a person and brought about by the Holy Spirit. It's important for us to understand that the agent or the person that's at work in our lives, bringing about spiritual regeneration is the Holy Spirit. And so to the magnitude that we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit is the magnitude by which we will have spiritual regeneration. And spiritual regeneration is the byproduct of spiritual realization, which is the byproduct of spiritual transformation. Y'all got it? Okay. And you watch this. And you, and, and you get into the realm of spiritual transformation by doing what? Yes, taking in new information. Got it? In this case, taking in God's word, understanding of who God is, understanding of who we are in light of God. All right. 
Um, and then once we understand that, we land in the realm of spiritual manifestation. This is where we kind of got caught up this morning in our dialogue, because we need to understand the difference between spiritual manifestation and watch this and trying to manufacture spirituality. Are y'all with me? There's a difference between manifestation and manufacturing. Most of what we do in the church falls under the banner of manufacturing. Are y'all with me? So if we put the right person on the organ and the right person on the drum and put the right person on the microphone to sing, and then we put the choir in the place and the choir has on the right uniform, and then, and then if I come in the door and the right ushers are on the door, what ought to happen is we ought to have the experience we want. That's the attempt to manufacture. Exactly. Because we have put things in place that we believe are going to bring about the result of what we need. But the reality is, is what we have to learn to do, watch this, is trust the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit lead and guide. And in order for the Holy Spirit to lead and guide, the Holy Spirit needs people who are willing to take in new information. People who are willing to go through spiritual transformation to such a regard that they are able to do what? To let the Spirit do what the Spirit desires to do. But most times we don't do that. I'm, I'm trying to Right. So we don't get the spirit's product in our lives. I was talking uh, this morning, teaching this morning, and I referenced what happened in our worship service on Sunday. Right. I went back and I looked at it and, and there were certain things that I believe happened and they didn't happen when we got here. They happened before we got here because there were dispositions where people said, you know what, I'm yielding to that. I'm letting that go. I'm letting. Um, and so when we came in, the spirit was able to work in places and in people who had given themselves over to whatever the spirit wanted to do. And watch this. And once that happened, the spirit took over. Are you understanding? You see, let me let me let me talk more personal about this. I know that young man that's on the organ. I seeded him to life. I know him. But when I looked over at him, I recognized something was going over there that had nothing to do with me. Y'all are mighty quiet. Because I understand the natural, but I also saw the spiritual. And so even, watch this, and even sometime when we are trying to get into, right, the nat when we're trying to manufacture, God will say, listen, that's not going to work. I'm going to disrupt your program. I'm going to mess up your agenda. I know I'm going I'm to I'm get a little preacher here, but y'all just, just, just work with me. All right. I know, Sister Harden, you printed all third shift. <laughs> all right. But I don't care what is on the order of service. God has an agenda and he overrides. Now, we say stuff like that in churchdom and in religiondom. But the reality is we don't believe that because we don't yield to the work of the Holy Spirit. Because we're programmed. We're rigid. Right. And, and more importantly, we're not sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why in the final session of this teaching, I want to talk about living life by the Spirit. Living life by the Spirit. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uncomfortable for some. Right? Why? Because we don't, we've, not been, we've not been forced into this type of consideration. But again, spiritual transformation requires, right, that you're willing to do what? Yield. Take in new information. So you got your hand out. I'm going to stay real close to it. I'm going to walk it because I want to finish it. And I'm only going to stop to respond to questions, but make sure your questions are in line with what we're talking about. All right? Y'all ain't saying that. I'm not telling you don't ask questions. Please ask questions if you have them. All right. So living life by the Spirit. If you live on earth, you're going to be in daily tensions with sinful flesh. It is unavoidable. Right now, we looked at Romans 7 and verses 15 through 25. Let me refresh your memory. Uh, it says this For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that what? That do it, but sin. That dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Do you know that? No, 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 seriously. Do you know that? Have you resolved that in you dwelleth no good thing? In your flesh dwelleth no good thing. I want you to say that with me. Say, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So don't have any expectation of anything good coming out your flesh. 
Go ahead and resolve that your flesh is no good. Because if you resolve that your flesh is no good, then the byproduct is you are now willing and able to live in accordance with your spirit. But if you keep trying to make good out of your flesh, y'all are mighty quiet, you're, you're going to fail. Y'all understand what I'm teaching you? This morning I told the class this. I said the flesh does what the flesh does. And ain't no need you trying to fool yourself into believing that you're going to get your flesh to do something other than what the flesh does. Because the flesh does what the flesh does. And you got to know that. You can dress it up, it's going to do what it's going to do. You can mascara it up, it's going to do what it's going to do. All right? You can clothe it up, it's going to do what it's going to do. Right? Now, what does that mean? Do you have to let it dominate you? Absolutely not. But you got to be aware that it's going to do what it's going to do. All right? Where does I stop? Hmm? Y'all don't know. Verse 19. He says, uh, for, for the good that I would I do not, for the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Who gets the credit for you doing or not, do, not doing what you would do? Sin, not you. Did you get it? Sin gets the credit. Say sin did it, right? That's the bottom line, because the flesh does what the flesh does. All right. He says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I want you to get that. That's what we're talking about doing. Delighting in the law of what? God. From where? The inward man. Because what I know is, look at me. The flesh does what the flesh does. And they don't need me expecting the flesh to do nothing other than what the flesh does because that's all the flesh can do. I ain't fooling myself and to let my flesh dominate me. I'm just going to go ahead and count my flesh as no good. And from now on, I'm going to live according to the law of God of the inward man. Y'all with me? All right. He says, uh, verse 23, but I see another law in my members. That's my flesh. And it's warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into what? Captivity to the law. He says, so now what I witness, what I understand is, watch this, that the flesh is doing what the flesh does. And I can decide that I'm going to live in accordance with what? The law of God, which is in the inward man. But I also discovered that when I do that, my flesh has the unmitigated goal to begin to work on my mind. Do you understand? So the flesh begins to send a signal to the mind every time that the spirit man starts to live in accordance with the law of God. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You've experienced it. I'm going to pray tonight, but you fall off to sleep. I'm going to read my Bible and all of a sudden it's something, right? You, you begin to understand. That's what the flesh does. Why am I telling you this? Because the more you become aware of that fact, the more you are able to listen, conquer it. Because the objective is I got to learn how to live the victorious Christian life. And I got to realize that my enemy, my closest enemy, is not the one I look out and see. The closest enemy is the one I carry around with me every day. If you learn to fight yourself before you fight somebody else, you'll be on a great track to being a champion. Whoop you before you whoop somebody. Ooh-wee. Y'all are mighty quiet. That's why the Bible says you're talking to me about forgiveness and you got, well, listen. I got a toothpick, but you got a telephone pole in your eyes. Whoop you. God, he's whispering to me, right? That's why the Bible says that one of the fruit of the spirit is what? Self-control. Deal with you. Get you some Pee Wee Herman theology. I know I am, but what are you? <laughs> Y'all with me? Okay, okay, let's keep working. All right. I can tell I probably ain't going to make it. But... Okay, so I see another law in my members, warring, 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 warring against the law of my mind and bringing me in the captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, look at what it's doing. It's bringing me into the law of my members. Right? Your flesh, listen, your inward man is like, I'm going to worship the Lord. Your flesh says, what? Worship the Lord. You know you don't know nothing about worshiping the Lord. And you go, well, 
now that that warfare is on. But the objective of the signal sent from the flesh to the mind is to get you to discredit the life Christ has died to give you. It's to cause you to see yourself, watch this, locked into the flesh in the consciousness of your mind. Y'all tracking? Okay, let's keep walking. Um, then he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the what? Law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Do you see the picture? You are not going to be victorious by dotting every I and crossing every T. Because the flesh does what the flesh does. But your victory is going to come, watch this, from your determination, watch this, your determination to live according to the law of God, which is the inward man, and to do it according to your mind. Y'all see it? Look, look, at verse, look at verse 25 again. So I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with, my, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. So you don't, yes, ma'am. Get her a mic, y'all, because them folk going to be mad at me on virtue. Thank God for young ladies. Okay, if, if that's the case and you're saying, you know, we're fighting, we've got the law of the mind the, against the law of the, um, uh, the law of God against the law of flesh. Okay, and flesh does what flesh does, but we are trying in our mind to do what God says do. But flesh does what flesh does. Does that mean that that will forever be a barrier? Is what, that flesh? A, yeah. Yes. Flesh. Would, yes. So we will never attempt yes. attain what flesh we're trying does. to attain. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are you trying to attain? What God wants us to do. Will the flesh always be a hindrance there? The flesh will always be at war. Yes. Okay. The flesh is going to do what the flesh is going to do. Okay. So our what we achieve then is going to be as much as we can achieve by overcoming our flesh, right? Or what I'm trying to say, if we're I, trying to be God-like and we're trying to do what God says to do, but the flesh is going to be the flesh and it's always going to be a hindrance, we're never, there's always going to, we're never quite going to get there, are we? Interesting. Or are we always in transformation? That's what I mean. That's what I say. We never quite get there. So we're always trying. Or are we always in spiritual transformation? Always in. Always trying to achieve something more. No, ma'am. Always in spiritual transformation. So, so let, me say, let me say it this way. Say it again. Yes. Let's say, say, yes. Yes. So, so, so I'm going to respond to people who ain't got mics. And y'all ain't got mics, so you can't ask me no question. So you're confusing folks. So, so, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. The objective is what he's literally saying is this. Since it is that the things of the flesh are fixed, but the things of the mind are not, the place of the influence, the fixed flesh attempts to influence the mind. But you can decide that you're going to live in accordance with the law of God, which is in the inward part, which is the spirit, spirituality, right? which means you nullify the flesh. Now the flesh is going to do what the flesh is going to do, but you start living victoriously when you minimize the impact of the flesh's objective. And it starts, first of all, with a mental disposition to say, I, I don't care what you say flesh. I don't care what the flesh does. I am who God says I am, and I'm going to live in accordance with what I know God has put, put in my spirit the spirit nature of God, of Christ. That, that, do you understand? Because what I heard you say is, and you, you shaped your question in dialogue of success, but success is not based in accomplishment. Success in, remember, remember the, the moving sidewalk? I'm walking. I, even if I'm standing still, I'm moving forward. But when I engage the forward motion with the walking, I'm still not on the ground. The ground is insignificant when I'm standing on the moving sidewalk. Is the flesh. 
the flesh is insignificant. You roll right past that ground as if it wasn't there. You don't even look over at it. You don't pay it any attention because it's not predicated on where you're going. It's no longer a factor. That's what he's saying. Am I making sense? You lock you, you have to lock in in the spirituality. Again, we're talking about life, living life by the spirit. All right? All right. So there were some questions or hands or something over here. Y'all, y'all, y'all done? Okay, so you ain't gonna ask me no later. Cause they may need to hear the question. Pastor Mike, okay, go, so, you go. So I was gonna say, um, so when the apostle Paul was saying he crucifies his flesh daily. Yes, he's I die daily. Yeah. I, yes, die, I die, daily. die daily. I die daily. I'm I'm diminishing the value of flesh. I'm diminishing the value of humanity. I'm living by the spirit. I'm getting that. I think the pastors want just to know that you're never going to conquer this. But you're going to get better at it. Don't pay too much attention because sin is going to be sin. But it's your walk. Conquering it is diminishing. Conquering it is diminishing. I'm going to show you in a minute. First of all, part of the biggest issue. Now, let me no, let me let me do it now. What what is one of the things that we learned that prohibits right the walking in this victorious walk? Right. One of the things is what do we do with the dilemma? What do we do with the dilemma? Huh? Say, it. we give it to the Lord. We under we we delegate the dilemma to the Lord. Right. Why do we do that? We do that because we understand the potency and the power of the Lord versus the potency and the power of the dilemma. The battle is not ours. Watch this. If you read what Paul said, he said, that this thing is going on, man, what I would do, I won't do. Da, da, da. He says, but I found out there's a law. The law is in my members. Right? And the law is in my flesh and it's warring against the law of God in my inward part. Who's the battle? Whose battle is it? It's not yours. You understand? But that's the mistake we make. We try to fight to be righteous. We try to fight our flesh to be righteous. Let me go back to my statement. It is easier, y'all remember, to, re to receive what the Lord has done than to rest in it. We can rest in the potency of what God has done. That's why, I, that's why you can't walk with God religiously. You got to walk with God relationally. Because religiously, you're going to try to dot the I's and cross the T's. That's what I heard as the undergirding of your question. We're never going to get there. We're never going to be perfect. No, no you're going to be perfect, but it's not going to be because you do it. It's because you rest in what God has done, and you stay on that walking sidewalk, that moving sidewalk, and you let that perfection come about. Does that make sense? All right. Y'all a good class tonight. I don't know if I'm gonna get finished, but y'all a good class tonight. Are there any questions, Gio, on from our virtual audience? All right, thank you, sir. All right. Um, so let's pick this up. Let's go over to okay, let's just stay with our text. So the good news is I'm under Romans 7, 15, 25. The good news is that despite the tension with the desires of the flesh, you do not have to be defeated by them. God promises that when you live by the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Did y'all get that? It's, it's one or the other. If you live in accordance to the flesh, you're going to have to deal with the things of the flesh. But if you live in accordance with the spirit, it nullifies the work of the flesh. Flesh going to do what the flesh going to do. But that ain't got nothing to do with what you do. Got it? All right, let's keep working. Um, let's go over to Galatians chapter 5. Lady, you got your mic? All right. You said that like you so soft-spoken. I need you to. Mary, you got a mic? She, 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 Y'all saved because I was getting ready to get her. All right, Galatians chapter 5. Somebody read verses 16 and 17. Lady, you got it? Go ahead and read that. This I say then, walk in the spirit, 
and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Mm -hmm. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. All right. Now, this is not information. This is strategy. Did you hear what I said? This is not information. It is strategy. It is teaching us how to conquer the flesh. And it's very simple. It's very simple. If you're going to go out that door, right, you got to go that way. If you're going to come in, that, in the sanctuary, you got to come this way. If you're going to, listen, fulfill the lust of the flesh, you know you're walking according to the flesh. But if you're not going, if you don't want to do that, you got to walk what? According to the spirit. That's simple. But it's also strategy. If I find myself engaged, right? If I find myself engaged in an experience if, and I've been brought into spiritual transformation, I'm walking with the Lord. All of a sudden, I find myself dealing with flesh. Man. This morning, I taught him this. If flesh stops you, then it's going to turn you. Are you with me? And it's going to turn you away from the things of God. And when you find yourself turning away from the things of God, you can be crystal clear that somewhere in the context of your existence, you have yielded yourself over to what? The flesh. Because you are walking after the flesh. Because you can't walk after the flesh and the spirit at the same time. You see the strategy? So what's the, what's the victory? If I find myself doing this and I'm turned, what, what am I to do? Exactly. My fight is to recognize, oh, flesh got me. And so now I'm, that's my objective. And how do I change? Yes, sir. I take in new information. I don't have to just go, he stopped me. He's turning me. No. What I do is I'm going in a direction I don't want to go. How do I go in the direction I want to go? I start seeking what? Information to put me back in line with my spiritual walk. Ooh, wee. You're tracking me? All right. Um, so to gain spiritual victory over the flesh, you need to live by the spirit. Question, what does it mean to live by the spirit? Living is defined as regulating or conducting your life according to a specific purpose and guide. It means taking charge of your life in such a way that you are making constant decisions and adjustments throughout the day to conduct yourself according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Wow. How many of you did something today you wish you hadn't done? Anybody? I got one, two, three. How, watch this. How many of you would, would admit tonight that when you did it, there was something that told you not to do it before you did it? You didn't hear nothing. You was all in, huh? Child said, I was all in. I know. No, somewhere in the context of the circumstance, Holy Spirit said, uh uh, that's not for your benefit. Now, watch that. And it didn't have to be, man, I robbed a bank. No, as simple as, you know what? I'm blowing my diet. Yeah. <laughs> Are y'all understanding? I know I shouldn't be eating this. But, right? Are y'all understanding what I'm teaching? Right? Now, now, how do I adjust to that situation? Right? My wife came in here. There was, there was three packs, two packs left. Three packs of candy bars. They're gone. I gave them away. I moved them for the second class. Right? I wasn't going to see them twice. All right? <laughs> I adjusted my position. Found somebody else who would eat. I took in new information. Y'all so silly. Come on. All right. So how does the Holy Spirit lead? How, how, do, how do you know what the Spirit wants you to do? Right. One, Holy Spirit uses God's truth, the scriptures. The scriptures. Listen, you're not going to become a spiritually mature Christian apart from the word of God. 
It's not going to happen. I'm okay, bro. You, you all right? You good? Okay. It's, it's not going to happen, right? People who do not make, have a high priority for the scriptures are somebody who will never live spiritually, right? Will never live out their spiritual truth either. They're God truth, all right? That, that's important. So the Holy Spirit uses God's, God's truth. Uh, John 16, 13, somebody have that? Read it for us. John, John 16, 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So, so this picture, this word paints the picture of a God who speaks to the spirit to speak to us. Did you catch that? That, he, that we might have possession of truth for whatever it is, that we might have guidance. Are y'all tracking with me? Read it again, Mary. Some folks look confused. Listen to me. I'll break. No, amplified. Oh, no. Whatever you got, I know you got 16 Bibles. Just read one of them. <laughs> okay, amplified. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Stop. So how do I get to truth? I'm guided by Holy Spirit. Go on. Full and complete truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but he will speak whatever he hears. Stop. He, so, so watch this. Spirit ain't just speaking to be speaking. Mm -mm. He's speaking in context and conduct with, with God's objective for your life. Mm -hmm. In all thy ways, acknowledge. acknowledge him and he will what? Direct, Direct your path. Mm -hmm. Not if you ain't listening. Oh, not if you're not sensitive. And if you're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit's guidance, then who, what you gonna listen to? feelings nothing more than see you gonna i feel like i want to i feel like i, I, I want to do this i feel like doing this I, or i don't feel like right mm -hmm. go ahead okay so from the father the message regarding the son regarding the son and he will disclose to you what is to come in the future okay so so god's word is to be is to be read, is to be studied, is to be memorized, is to be meditated on, and the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance what God says you should do every time you face a decision. Every time. Now think about, do me a favor, think about how many times you make a decision and you do not consult with God. Think about all of the possibilities, right, that you forfeited by not consulting with God. Am I making sense? And I want to I I dispel the notion that you have to have this sense of re religion to, to, to talk to God or to hear from God. That's not what I mean. But you can stop in the middle of your work day and say, God, show me, show me what to do here. It's that simple, right? And God says, because you are seeking him, y'all are mighty quiet. He will abound to you in what you need. You don't have to rely on your feelings. You can trust that God will speak to you because you have turned yourself toward him and he has obligated himself to lead and guide you. That's what living according to the spirit or living by the spirit is, is, is like, right? Um, let me keep running. Yo, any questions, thoughts, reflections? Let's keep moving. So God's promise to the children of Israel stands as God's promise to us today. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. Let's go there. Everybody turn there. Lady, are you there? I figured you was. She's, a, she's always prepared. She's headed again. Go ahead and read it then since you're there. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. Wow. This is a promise that came to the children of Israel, right? He says to them that the word, read that again. The word will be where? Watch, check the disposition. 
and thine ears shall ye hear a word behind thee, behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, and ye, when ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. Now check this. No. Walk that way. Straight. Turn around. I didn't tell him to stop, y'all. I don't know what's wrong with it. Keep walking. Just keep, just keep walking. Turn right. Your other right. So, so what I want, what I, okay, come on back and sit down because you're not good. You're not good. You're just not good. Watch this. You ever heard the term rear guard? He can see what you can see. And he's guiding you, right? But you got to hear his voice. That word hear there does not mean capture the sound. It means to accept the direction or the directives. Am I making sense? Now, what would cause us not to accept the directives? Flesh is a general answer. Be more specific. Suppressing the spirit is, a, is an answer, but be more specific. I know the way. My mind knows the better way. You got, you got GPS on, but you want to turn here. Oh, I'm bad about it, y'all. I'm horrible at it. Right? Baby, can I turn here? She ain't said nothing. Y'all understand the point? All right. All right, let's keep working. So the Holy Spirit is that voice guiding you through the promises and the principles of God's word. I want to do something. Okay, yeah, we're here. Galatians chapter 5. Everybody in your go to Galatians chapter 5. Y'all get anything out of this? Galatians chapter 5. I don't know why I do that, and I put all three of the translations that I want you to look at in your handout, but I just tell you to go anyway. All right. Uh, I want to look at this because this basically, again, is the strategy on how you walk as a victorious Christian, or how you live that victorious life. This is the strategy. And I want to read this from several translations, and then I want to talk about how th this passage is put together. Uh, from its original language in order to give you some greater understanding. Y'all with me? All right. So uh, Galatians 5, 16, 17, it says, this I say then, right? Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would do. You got that? Now, but what if you want to do the thing you need to do? How do I conquer that? Are you tracking with me? First, you understand what's preventing you from doing it. You identify that the flesh does what the flesh does. Does that make sense? All right. I want you to listen to this uh, in the Amplified. I'm sure Mary has already read it. She says, but I say walk habitually in the Holy Spirit. Notice walk in the Spirit is amplified by habitually. You with me? Seek him and be responsive to his guidance. And then you will certainly not carry out the desire of the sinful nature, which responds impulsively, 
without regard of God and his precepts. So now we've got a description of the flesh. It acts impulsively and without regard to God's purposes and God's precepts. The flesh is going to do what the flesh is going to do. What is that? No, what is that according to Amplify? What is the flesh going to do? No. It, how about you just read what I just read to you? Give back to the teacher what the teacher gave to you and you will pass the test. The flesh is going to do what? Walk how? Listen, impulsively without regard for God and his precepts. So now you know what Paul couldn't explain in words. All Paul said is, I know this. I get ready to do one thing, I don't do that. Why, Paul? Because the Amplified teaches us that the flesh does what the flesh does, which is act impulsively and without regard to the precepts and the principles of God. Are y'all with me? Okay. All right. Y'all getting slow because we're getting later. Come on. Rub your temple. Rub your temple. All right. Now watch this. Verse 17. For the sinful nature has its desire, which is opposed to the spirit. And the desire of the spirit opposes the sinful nature. Listen, she ain't got, flesh got a problem with the spirit, so what? Spirit got a problem with the flesh too. Y'all got it? If you got a spirit that don't have a problem with the flesh, it ain't the Holy Spirit. Are y'all understanding me? It could be your spirit, it could be the devil's spirit, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. All right? The Holy Spirit never sides with the flesh. All right. For these two, the sinful nature and the spirit nature, are in direct opposition to each other, continually in conflict. Did, did you check? Did you catch that? Watch this. Continually in conflict. It's just, it's just hard. I want you to hear this because it doesn't matter where you are on the trajectory of spiritual transformation. It's still you, your flesh, and your spirit, man, and that's going to continually be a battle. That's why I said we are continually in what spiritual transformation until we are changed, right? When we are changed and we now have the nature of the spirit, man, we will no longer be in that. But as long as we're here, we're going to always be in that tension. That tension will be there. It's like, it's like arthritis. It's there. <laughs> I got some witnesses, <laughs> right? Okay, let me keep moving. Y'all pray for me. God ain't through with me yet. All right. Now, why is it there? Look at this. It's in direct opposition to each other, continually in conflict, so that you, as a believer, do not always do whatever good things you want to do. That's why it's there. Y'all got it? Okay, we're going to take this one step further, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go look at Eugene Peterson, and I'm, I want you to hear how Eugene Peterson articulates in the Message Bible the same thing. Right? He says, my counsel is this. Live freely. Animated and motivated by God's spirit. Let me part. Live freely. In other words, forget about the flesh. Stop giving credibility to the flesh. Loose yourself from the flesh. You ain't got to be worried about the flesh. Don't you let the flesh tell you what you can and cannot do. Y'all with me? Live freely, for where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Animated, another word for animated, is in action. Let your action be what? Stimulated by the spirit. Does that make sense? Do what the spirit says do. Am I making sense? And then motivated, that's the engine, driven by the spirit. Am I making sense? All right. Then you won't feed the compulsion of the selfishness. Oh, wait. Then you won't feed the compulsion of what? 
oh my God. So selfishness then is defined as the flesh doing what the flesh does. Are y'all tracking with me? The selfishness is that inclining to the law of the flesh against the law of God. Ooh, it's, it's me, my, I-ism as opposed to God, him-ism. Y'all tracking with me? All right, watch what he says. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us. It's true, we ain't no good in the flesh. And it's at odds, y'all with me? Watch this. With a free spirit, which means it has the intention of incarceration. Just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness, these two are, are ways of life are antithetical so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. <laughs> so now what's been removed from you is you being able to say, I don't feel like it. But when you say, I don't feel like it, you just told God, I don't want what you want. I don't care if you are living inside of me, leading me and guiding me and directing me. And then the next day you have the unmitigated God to say, Lord, help me. Y'all still here? <laughs> I got a question. We good, G? All right. All right. <laughs> All right, let, let's finish this. He says, um, why don't you choose to be led by the spirit? That's a question. And so escape the erratic compulsions of the law-dominated existence. Why don't you choose? Am I making sense? If he asks the question, why don't we choose? It is clear that we have the ability to choose. Remember, I taught you earlier that the only reason that we fall into to many of those things that are contrary to God is because we accept the invitation. We receive it. You ain't got to accept every invitation. Who we? Are y'all understand? All right. Now, so. Paul says, now, 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 now we're going to shift. I'm going to shift. Any questions on what you've seen? I read those three ver translations because I want you to see the progression and the identity of selfishness. I wanted you to see how it is that when we make a, when we do what we want to do, it's in opposition to God, not just in opposition to what God wants done. Right? I want, I want you to see that. Now, I want to talk about how these verses are, have been put together. In the original languages, right, things that doesn't show up in the translation is that there are what's called tenses, moods, right? And, uh, and, and they give insight on, on a greater understanding of what's being, being said in a particular text. So just walk with me. There's, there's the present tense. Say the present tense. Now, the present tense refers to a continuous, ongoing, regular action. Gio, you sleep? Come on, roll with me then. Appreciate it. Yeah, we, we come on up a little higher. Come on up a little. No, go down some more. Then. No, come back the other way. Uh, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep. I want you to just keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on moving. Don't stop. No, keep on going. I say keep on going. Scroll some more. You sleep? Just scroll up a little more. Just a little more. All right, well, just stay right there. Then. Stay right there. All right. All right, so, so, so present tense refers to a continuous, ongoing, regular action that is happening in real time. So it's ongoing. It is something that you need to do every moment of every day. You re reference Paul's statement, I die daily. By using the present tense, Paul is telling us that every moment of every day, you need to do what? Regulate your life. There is no such thing 
as an unconscious moment for the believer. Do, do you understand what I'm teaching? Okay. Living every moment of every day under the direction of the Holy Spirit is something that only you can do. Only you can hear the promptings of the Holy Spirit as he guides you into God's truth. Only you can make the decision to, here's the word, yield to his will and apply God's truth immediately. Say immediately. Because when you give space to the adversary, when you give space to the flesh, the flesh, I told you, once it, turned, once it turns you, it wants to take you away. All right? So you understand when, I, when, it, when, it mean, when it says present tense, this is something that you must do, all right, continuously. The imperative mood, going up, the imperative mood means, that's good, this isn't an option. It's not an option. It's a command. When he says, walk in the spirit, that is not an invitation. It's a command because it's in the imperative mood. We are commanded by God to conduct ourselves every day living according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's his command. You think thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, thou shall not kill. Those are commandments when you are under the law. But when you are in the liberty of Jesus Christ in the spirit, you are commanded to do what? Walk how? In the spirit. In the processing of spiritual transformation that leads to spiritual regeneration, right? Spirit, spiritual revelation. That's what he's talking about every single day. Every day, God is trying to give you new information to change you that you may become more like him. Are you with me? All right. The, um, the imperative move, all right? The imperative move means this isn't an option, right? It's a command. We are commanded by God to conduct everyday living to the leading of the Holy Spirit. He commands it because he knows it is best for us. Got it? Now, also, the use of the verb there, live by, so he indicates forward movement. I, I kind of already referenced this when I talked about the walking cycle, all right? In other words, you are going from where you are right now to where it is you ought to be. That's why it is continuous. It's perpetual, right? And when you're doing that, I want you to catch this because this is what chop, this messes up a lot of believers, right? Especially religious believers. Spiritual growth is the byproduct of perpetual spiritual transformation. You are growing because you are what? Being transformed. You said it earlier, lady. You said becoming. That's why we never reach it. So when we talk about what spiritual growth is, it's not that we've reached a stage where now we have memorized all the scriptures and we can quote the 66 books of the Bible and we know how to speak in this way and say this this way, but that ain't spiritual growth. In fact, it's really quite the contrary, right? It's quite the contrary because if you have, if you can identify yourself as with a coin faith, you're not in transformation anymore, right? Exactly. Have you ever wondered why it is we're, we're told things scripturally like God can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power to work within us? Think about what we say. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think but it's according to the power that worketh in us because what we ask or think does not define the power in us the power in us is already defined it already knows what god is capable of ours is to look at what we experience and then know that there is a power at work that's within us that is able to get us beyond it and we cannot allow what what the circumstances are that caused us to be in it to define the outcome that would make us losers not winners oh uh, y'all listen i'm gonna go and finish this um i got one minute um in other words, you're going from where you are right now to where you ought to be. 
This is spiritual growth. Only as you submit your life to the what? Spirit's control. Will you move forward, growing spiritually and victoriously in your Christian life? So there is no victorious Christian living without spiritual transformation. It, it, it's just not possible. You, can, you may become the greatest icon of religious practice. You got me? You, you, you might be, and I ain't, ain't going to pick on nobody, but you might be, you may get the award for being the greatest, you fill in the blank religiously. But it won't be spiritual growth and it won't be victorious living. All right. All right. So the victorious, this is a summary statement. The, the victorious life of a Christian is lived out, I want you to catch this, step by step with the Holy Spirit. Moving you from where you are to where God is leading you, where he wants you to be where he wants you to be, where he wants you to be, all right? The Holy Spirit is the guy. This is exactly why Paul said that when you live by the Spirit, you will not gratify the sin desires of the flesh. The fact is you cannot live the Christian life by your own strength or resources any more than you can save yourself for, for, for eternity. So victorious Christian spiritual, victorious Christian Living is spiritual living, and spiritual living, watch this, is worship full life living. I want you to catch that last statement. It is worship full life living, Giovanni. It is the last line on the page that they're trying to read that they can't see. That's the one. Spiritual living is worship full life, living. Are y'all getting it? Right? Now, the next series or teaching, I better say teaching because I don't know what I'm going to do series. We'll be talking about a worshipful life. But you can figure it out because the worshipful life is the life where you are living in accordance with what God has purposed you to do. It's the woman at the well. Remember? That sister was living a life. The discussion at the well that Jesus had to get to was to help her to understand that her view of worship was wrong. <laughs> she thought worship was what took place in a mountain. And she learned that from her father's historical patriarchs. Are you hearing me? But what she discovered was that ain't what happened. That ain't what real worship was. Because Jesus said, woman, there's coming a day when worship, right? How? They that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. Right? All righty. I appreciate your attentiveness tonight. I thank you for tracking with me and let me get through this. I just kind of felt like we've been in it way too long. It was supposed to be a two-week lesson that turned into a what four-week lesson? That's because y'all are good class and y'all ask good questions. Are there any questions, any comments, any reflections? Any? Seeing none, Geo, are we good virtually? I'm like, I don't even think you be talking to them people. You just don't be left giving them a chance to ask no questions. Be answer me too fast. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, I think there are no announcements. Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. I'll send you a bill for it. Go, uh, <laughs> okay, it's got it has. As you went on, it, it not only clarified what I was asking you, but it put me in a different frame of mind, too, because on a moving sidewalk, actually, you know, it goes in sections. And at some point, you it stops, you get off, and you have to walk to the next section. When you're talking about the flesh, fighting the flesh and God's word, 
and the flesh stops you and turns you around, that's when you get off that sidewalk. So yeah. you can choose to get off of it and go do your thing, yeah. or you can choose to go straight, get back on that exactly. moving sidewalk. And, and notice this, notice this too, right? You got to be careful. Watch this. <laughs> listen, listen, because you're being carried, you got to be careful getting off. Exactly. Watch this. Exactly. And and watch this. In order to get back on, you got to take another step. And you can stumble and fall both ways. I like that. Yeah. That keeps yeah. You you, you got to take another step. Sure. And you got to be balanced. Are you know what I'm saying? Y'all gonna be teaching and preaching my message all over the place. As I can see y'all y'all excited. I can see y'all y'all. Oh, by the way, I got the report that you were gonna steal my message and preach it in Georgia. I want my check. All right. All right. All right. Y'all, 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 y'all good. Listen, I pray you've been helped. I pray you've been um, encouraged to, 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 again, I, I said to the morning class and I'll say it to you, um, faith grants you the permission to accept what you learn, even when you don't quite get it. It's never going to kill you. It's the word of God. It can only better you. But if you never, if you never, if you never attempt to receive it, you'll never experience it. So my prayer is that as you leave, you begin to contemplate that your life in Christ Jesus is lived from above and from within, right? And that it is a walk that is in eternity. It's an eternal walk. You're already walk, living your eternal life. And you're conquering this experience. And you're already victorious. I want you to catch that. You're already victorious. Do not live your life to be victorious. Live your life from a place of victory. Right? I'm going to leave it there. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the hearts and minds of those who have received your word readily. Now, God, we pray through continued prayer and further study, you would nurture the seed of this word, that we not just be hearers of it, but we shall become doers of it as well. And God, uh, we ask your blessings upon each and every person under the sound of my voice, both, Lord, in the building and virtually. We ask the blessing upon those, the Heavenly Father, who desired to be here couldn't. We ask your blessing upon those who could be here and, and chose not to. But we just simply ask that you continue to be merciful, continue to be gracious to us. And as we prepare to leave this place, we ask that we never escape your presence. Any circumstances, Lord, of domestic fashion, the Heavenly Father, or living in this world that are on the hearts and minds of your people that need heaven's attention, we yield all of it to you, God. We just give you permission to work in the circumstances and the affairs of our lives, that you would get the glory, that we will be edified, and that our lives will reflect that which you prescribe for this season of existence. Again, we thank you, God, and we praise you for this time. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray, and all in agreement would say amen. Amen. My sister, God bless you. Good to see you again with us tonight. God bless you, God.